Hello, I'm going to take you through the A-Level Computer Science paper from June 2018. It's Unit 1 we're going to do. You're allowed a ruler, a pencil, but no calculator, and the test lasts two and a half hours. Question 1. A digital coffee making machine has a CPU that uses the Little Man Computer Instruction Set. Little Man Computer operates on a computer system based on the von Neumann architecture. State two features of the von Neumann architecture. So the key things that we've gone over in class is that the von Neumann architecture has one memory. So there's basically one RAM which, is, which stores instructions and data. So, so let's write that down. Okay, the other thing that we've covered in class generally has been the fact that there is one bus for instructions and data. So instructions and data are combined and they're sent over so it's sent over one bus. Okay, question two. Describe one feature not part of the von Neumann architecture which contemporary CPUs may have in order to prove improve performance. So basically this is asking us the opposite of the last one. So looking at the first one, the first point that we made up here, I would go for the fact that there are two different memories. One for data and one for instructions oh, sorry I missed. okay so what we're saying there is that you've got one memory two physical memories one for set storing instructions such as your LDAs your STAs and another to store data such as your actual variables scrolling down to part B now part of the coffee making machines code asks the user to press a button to select the strength of the code outputs one, which will switch on the green light to indicate a valid selection or zero to indicate an invalid selection. So basically, the machine has a button where you can say how strong you want your coffee to be. If what you put in is valid, it does a one, which gives a green light. Otherwise, it does a zero, which will presumably give a red light. Question one, tick the appropriate boxes below to indicate which inputs will result in a green light, i.e code outputs one and which will result in a red so we just need to tick in each box these boxes to say if it's green and to say if they're red so let's have a look at the code so we input we're going to input a number first of all that will be the strength and then that's going to get stored in entry which is down here at the bottom so we've got entry down here okay so it goes into entry and then what happens is we load up max, max is here and has the number five stored in it. And then what we do is we're gonna subtract entry. So from that five, I'm just gonna write five here. From that five, we're gonna subtract entry. Now, in the first occasion, entry is gonna be the number one. So we're gonna subtract one from five, which is gonna give us four. Okay, and then branch if positive to accept. So we're gonna branch down to positive, because, um, sorry, branch down to accept, because it's a positive value which is here which is telling us to load green light green light is down here which has a one so one is now going to be stored in the accumulator let's just write that here and where are we now and then after we load that we're on an out so we're going to output one which is just here and then we're going to halt okay so what we can tell from this is basically it you input a number and then you subtract that number from five. If it's positive, it's gonna output a one. So we can deduct from that that any number that is um, five or below is gonna give a green light because they're all gonna give positive numbers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tick all of these. Okay, so if we have the number six, let's see what's gonna happen. So we're gonna enter the number input the number six which gets stored in entry then we load max which is five we are going to subtract entry so that's going to give us minus one 
and then branch is positive to accept it's not positive so we're going to load LDA red light red light is down here so that's going to load a zero then once we've loaded that zero we're going to BRA so we're going to branch always to print an end print and end is over here so we're going to output that zero and then we're going to halt so basically anything over five is going to give a red light so I'm going to tick six onwards okay question two explain which registers and buses are used and the values they store slash carry when the line LDA red light is executed after it has been fetched and decoded you should assume the address red light refers to memory location 11 so what we're going to do is we are going to run through the code we're going to start from here where it says LDA green light and we're going to identify which registers are used and in addition to that we're going to say what data is stored in there so what I thought might help with this one is if we have a diagram here okay so the first thing that's going to happen is that we're loading a value so when we load a value we need the address stored so the address is going to be stored in the MAR so the MAR is going to store the value 11 so that's our first step there's only one place for this to go so that 11 is going to go down the address bus and then what happened this happen is we need to be told are we reading or writing from there so the control unit is going to send a read signal and that's going to go down the control bus so let's just quickly write all of that down so first of all we're going to have 11 is stored in the MAR it is sent okay so then what happens is we get a read signal good that's where we are so we've gone down to here the control signal has sent our read signal and then what happens is that we're going to load that data so if we have a look our next once we've loaded green light up here the data in there is a zero so we can say that a zero is loaded and then that's going to go to the MDR via the data bus okay and then ultimately it's going to go into the accumulator so we can just add that on now so zero is loaded from the memory it is sent down the data bus and stored in the MDR a copy is then sent to the ACC and that's the process so we've listed what registers are used, what data is included, and the route that it takes. Part 3. Write code in a high level language or pseudocode that has the same functionality as the code in figure 1. So basically all it's asking us to do is to write code for that copy machine. It's saying pseudocode or a high level language. What I would suggest you do is you just try to write Python code directly on the page and that will be somewhere in between so if we remember all that um, that code before does is it asks the user to enter a number and then it looks to see if well it, it subtracts five so it looks to see if it is five or or less and then what will happen it will just say it will return a one or a zero a one is green and a zero is red so let's do this it doesn't say that it's going to be a function or a procedure so what we can do is we can go straight in high level no def or anything so what we're going to do first of all is we can do the entry and that's going to be an input so we're going to get to input what strength would you like it okay then what we're going to say is if it's less than or equal to five 
we need to remember to make sure we say less than or equal sometimes people will go straight in and just say less than you could always say less than six because that would still work so we're going to say if entry is less than or equal to five then we need to tab it in just to show that it's inside of our if we can say that we want it to print one else we can tell it we want it to print zero and that's our question done part four discuss the differences between assembly code and high level languages refer to the advantages and disadvantages of writing programs in assembly code rather than high level language when each appropriate when each approach might be used why the copy machine was programmed in assembly code so I'm not going to write the full essay for this. I'm just going to go through some of the points. So first of all, what I would do is I would define what assembly code is and what a high level language is. OK, so you're going to want to talk about the fact that assembly code uses mnemonics. OK, which represents machine code. Um, high level languages are like a natural language um, you could talk about the fact that they need to be translated you could say that there are only if there's a limited number of assembly language instructions could also discuss that because of that assembly language might take more lines of code to perform a task And that it's um, it's specific to the hardware or the processor that you're using. Okay, so we start off and we just explain them. Now what we need to do is we need to talk about the advantages and disadvantages um, to a programmer really, because we need to give it some kind of context so we could talk about the fact that assembly language allows a programmer to use the exact exact commands that they want exact instructions they want and that you can write directly into the memory into the um, hardware um, with high level languages you need to have um, a translator which isn't the best because you don't want your coffee machine to have to translate the instructions so that would be down as one of the disadvantages Um, high level languages are easier to write in because they resemble na they as resemble natural language um, and you've got a variety of different languages I think that's referred to as paradigms so you could actually choose a language or a paradigm that's going to suit you best
then what we need to do is we need to be quite evaluative and we need to make sure that we're relating this to the task so we could talk about um, when the approach might be used so you could talk about the fact that when you're using embedded systems you would generally go with um, mnemonics sorry M -M. because actually you can write directly into the hard drive you could talk about the fact that um, it's going to be processor specific because it's not going to be updated all the time and it's generally going to be um, more efficient if you're going to use that okay um, another point that you could talk about is the fact that you don't want it to have to be um, you don't want to have to go through the translation again we're relating it to the to the scenario so you don't want your coffee machine to have to translate your instruction when you say you want it to be um, level five for example okay you want it to just just make your coffee straight away um, what else could we discuss we could discuss that um, yeah so you get you're gonna get more performance better performance from there as well make sure you're always relating it to the scenario with all of these generally for mark band free um, they will say that there is a discussion that is well balanced so the positives and the negatives but also that there are examples that are given so you need to give examples from the pack from the um, scenario that you're given right so question two a software company decides to build an operating system for OCR watches a memory management so memory management is one of the functions of an operating system list three functions other than memory management of an operating system so generally in class we'll go through the same ones we'll always first of all talk about the fact that it provides an interface for the user an interface okay then we would generally talk about the fact that it manages the CPU we would maybe talk about the fact that it provides security and we would generally also talk about the fact that it manages hardware I know there's more than that but they're the four we would generally go through in class and then what you'd want to do is you'd only want to write three of them because it says to only list three part of a memory computer's memory man memory is represented in figure two the operating system divides the memory into equally sized chunks so can you see we've got the different programs and they're all divided into different chunks and you've got program C there state the type of memory management used in figure two so this is what we call paging okay the alternative would be segmentation now we know that it's paging because they're all equally sized with segmentation there's more flexibility but they're equally sized so we know that it's paging okay part three the operating system needs to load program C into memory but there's not enough space describe how the operating system would use virtual memory to load program C so the way that virtual memory works is it uses part of the secondary storage or your hard drive and what happens is programs which aren't being used so say for example program A is just something like a program sitting there in the background not doing anything program A will get taken out of the main memory it'll get put into the secondary memory and then program C will be loaded into the main memory so the first thing that would happen is that we'd need to explain what virtual memory is so we can say that that's when the operating system using secondary storage as virtual memory okay we could then go on and we need to explain it now um, and we'd need to do it in the context of this program so we could talk about programs not being used a pro and we could say maybe a or b would be moved to the virtual memory and then program c would be moved into the memory in that place okay so we're just talking through those different steps 
Okay, part B. The company sets up a website to promote the watch. Part of the website is shown below. The sentence, download the fact sheet, is a hyperlink to the factsheet.pdf, which is stored in the same folder as the HTML file for the web page. So then underneath we've got the actual text that's on the web page. Then the actual task is to write the HTML to produce the extract from the web page above. You can assume it will be placed in the body tags of the pre-existing page. You do not need to specify the font. So first of all, what I'd suggest you do is maybe just write out the text that's on there. Okay. So we're going to just type that in. Okay. Then let's have a look at it. So the first line features is clearly a heading and it's quite big. So let's presume that is a heading one. So I'm going to do the H1 tag and at the end, I'm going to close it. can't currently see any formatting on the second line so we can always come back to that one if necessary so let's go down so on the, the bit below I've written the numbers in but actually I wouldn't have thought they'd want you to write the numbers in I should imagine that's what we call an ordered list so what we could do is we can say we're gonna have an ordered list here so I'm gonna put in the OL tag And let's close it down here and what we'd need to do is we need to make each of these a list item now so if we do the list item tag then just to speed I'm going to copy and paste that obviously in the exam you would be writing this out and then we need to add in the close tag Okay, good and then at the bottom it looks like it's underlined but actually if you look up here it says download the fact sheet is a hyperlink to the factsheet.pdf which is stored in the same folder so we're going to use the ahref tag for that so just over here we're going to do ahref equals and in speech marks we're going to write factsheet.pdf Okay, close the tag and then or close the, that section then over here we're going to close the tag with a forward slash a and that should be it okay part ii explain what happens when a search engine indexes the pages you do not need to discuss ranking okay so this is quite straightforward so a spider will follow all of the links In the page and then what it does is each word in the page is indexed well it's not that each page each word in the page is noted and then in its index the web page is added to the index of that word so think of it a bit like it's got a table of all the words there are and then when each word comes up sorry in each under each word your website or that website is added an entry for that website is added under each word which appears part three or part iii explain why using risc risk processor rather than cisc cisc processor is likely to result in increased battery life so I always remember the reduced instruction set risk that's what you'd have in a mobile whereas a complex instruction set CISC would be what you'd have in your general kind of PC so if you think about it um, risk it's gonna have a smaller instruction set because it's reduced okay so the risk has a smaller instruction set so think about that so little man computer the number of instructions that has compared to potentially something like Python okay and um, that's not strictly what it's asking but it's just a way of remembering it because you've got fewer instructions it means that your circuitry is going to have fewer um, fewer transistors because if you think about it all of those instructions need transistors you've got fewer instructions 
you're going to need fewer transistors because you've got fewer transistors that means less power is being used and that's it question three an airport holds details of flights in a database using the flight table an extract of the table is shown below so it's got information on the flight id flight number destination code destination name departure date and departure time describe what the sql statement below does so let's just break this down so first of all it says select flight number so it's going to select the flight number that's this column here from flight that's the whole table where destination code equals jfk so the destination code needs to be jfk okay so that's what it's going to do now we need to just explain that quickly so what we're going to do is we'll put it here and we're just going to explain step by step what happens so it will um, show the flight number from the flight table but only for flights with the destination code JFK and then let's say what those flight numbers that they would be these would be flight numbers so it's O C zero zero eight nine and O C seven seven five zero. Excellent. Part B. The airport cancels all its flights to Heathrow on the fourth of July twenty twenty eighteen. The SQL statement below shows all the data for the flights going to Heathrow. Rewrite it so it instead removes all the flights to Heathrow on the 4th of July 2018. So we need to change it so it deletes rather than just shows us data. So the first thing we're going to do is instead of saying select, we're going to say delete. Okay, and we want to delete all from flight. Now we need to say which ones to delete. So we need to make sure that it's going to Heathrow. So let's set the destination name to Heathrow. So we'll say where destination name. Remember to leave, don't put a space in between them because it's gonna be, it needs to be exactly the same. Equals and we're gonna have, a, have speech marks because it's a string, Heathrow. Okay, so we've got the destination. And we need to put the departure date. And departure date equals, and we're gonna set that to 0407 2018. Done. Part C. Tables often have primary and secondary keys. Statewide destination code would not be a suitable primary key for the flight table. Right, so ultimately that's down to the fact that a primary key needs to have unique data and destination code could potentially have duplicates. Statewide destination code would be a suitable secondary field. So a secondary field is a field that you choose to search on. Um, so for example, if you're in a school database, you're not necessarily going to search by the pupil ID, you would search by pupil name. So that's why it would be, that's what a secondary, a secondary field is. So destination code would be a suitable secondary key 
for the flight table because it's likely to be searched by or sorted by. Part D, the airline wishes to ensure the database is normalized. Describe why the database can be considered to be in first normal form. So these are pretty standard answers. However, on the mark scheme, there was one question, one point which came up which surprised me. So the first thing is always that first normal form has no repeating, uh, sorry, no repeating records no repeating attributes it should also all data should be atomic that basically means that no data no um, attributes should have multiple pieces of data stored in them one answer that was on the mark scheme that surprised me was that it has a primary key that was one which hadn't come up in the teaching that we'd done earlier. Describe why the database can be considered second normal form. So second normal form is quite straightforward. It's first of all, it must be in first normal form. And the second point is that all data needs to be dependent, or sorry, all fields need to be dependent on the primary key. Describe why the database cannot be considered to be in third normal form. So in third normal form, um, you can't have um, data which is dependent on something other than the primary key. So if we go to the database up here, if we have a look, so flight number is based on the flight ID, destination code is not based on, well it would be based on the flight ID, but Destination name is dependent on the destination code. It's not dependent on the flight ID. So that's what the issue is. So, so for example, if you chose set your destination code to LHR, the destination name would have to be Heathrow. It's, it's dependent on the code. So it could not be considered third normal because there are non-key attributes dependent on non-key attributes. For example, um, we could say um, departure so destination name is dependent on destination code not and what's our primary key not flight ID the primary key okay good Part E, the airport wishes to allow airlines to be able to access the data it has on flights via the internet. Describe one format or method the airline could use to provide the data to the airlines so it could be used, so they could use it in their own applications. So basically, it's asking how can they send the data to, how, they can, how can they send it to airlines? So what we've covered in class there are two main ways so the first would be they could do some kind of an extract and create a csv file which is a comma separated values file which will store the data as text
another option could be to use SQL language. Simple query language. And then they could maybe incorporate it into some kind of a database. Question four. The internet can be considered an example of a WAN. Describe what is meant by the term WAN. So a WAN is a wide area network. And we'll explain what that is. This is, um, you could say, several devices communicating together over a large geographical area. The internet uses a set of protocols referred to as the TCP IP stack. The TCP IP stack consists of four different layers, each with its own set of protocols. Explain why protocols are important on a network. So protocols, they are basically the rules that allow, um, allow devices to communicate. So first of all, you need them to, to enable, you need them to enable devices to be able to communicate and they do this by ensuring that they all follow the same rules next of all we need to name state the state the name of the four layers of the TCP IP stack so we'll start with application transport, internet, and then we've got the, I would say the physical layer. Sometimes you can call this different layers. It's often referred to as the network interface or network data layer. Question five. A software company is producing software that allows users with severe mobility issues to input data into a computer. The software flashes up letters on the screen one at a time. The user sends a signal to the computer when the letter they want appears on the screen. State the name of an input device and describe how it could be used by a user with very limited mobility in their hands and arms to send a signal to the computer. So in essence, letters appear on some kind of a screen and then the user uses some kind of device, some kind of input device to say that's the letter that they want. The user's got limited mobility, so we need to really think of something which is less physical. I would by default say a microphone, because they could always just say yes when the correct letter comes up or something similar. And that's the next part. How would it be used? So the user could make a sound when the correct letter appears on the screen. Part B. Rather than displaying the whole alphabet, once the first letter has been entered, the program only shows the letters that could be possible according to the words in the dictionary. All possible words are stored in a tree data structure. The program is tested on the sample dictionary of four words represented as a tree in figure three. So those words would be barren, baths, belts, sorry, below and belts. Question one, annotate figure three to show how the word belts would be removed from the tree. So we're removing. So let's just look at the letters that we need. So we'd go for B. We're going to be considering B, E, L, T, and S. Okay. So what we would do, we would work work down there. So B is connected to the A and E, so we'll leave that. E is connected to L still. L is connected to T and T is connected to S. S isn't connected to anything, so we can get rid of that one. T will then not be connected to anything either, so we can get rid of that. L is still connected, so we'll leave it. We'll just stop there. So we're going to remove T and S. Okay, next question. The developer decides she wants to make the software program open source. Explain the benefits 
to the users of software being open source. So the number one thing which I'm always talking about in class is that open source software is free. Okay, so that's our number one, it's free. The second thing we always talk about is the fact that you can customize it to do what you want. So if you want to maybe enhance it in a certain area, you can do that. That's because you have the ability to access and change the source code. And also one of the big things with open source, and this is a bit of a, a strange one sometimes, you can say that um, because it's open source, other people in the community can spot errors. Question six. Technology is changing too quickly for the law to keep up. Discuss to what extent you agree with the statement above. In your discussion, you should explain which laws regulate the use of technology and how advancements in technology have made the laws difficult to enforce slash implement. So this is a question all around legislation. So what we can do, they've asked us to say which laws there are, first of all, surrounding the use of technology. So we can start off by listing them. So we'll start off with the Data Protection Act. Another would be the Computer Misuse Act. Copyrights and Patent Act. And you could also do the Regulation of Investigator Investigatory Powers Act. Okay, you'd want to explain what each law does. So you could talk about the Data Protection Act that um, makes sure that data is collected, stored, and used fairly. Okay. Computer Misuse Act, you could talk about how that prevents unauthorized access. Copyrights and Patents that protects intellectual property. And the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, that one regulates how government agencies use IT. specifically for um, surveillance. Okay, so moving on. So we've, we've spoken about what laws there are, okay? Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to, we're gonna make it a bit more subjective than this. So we need to talk about the use, um, uses of them. So we could talk about things like um, the Computer Misuse Act potentially being more difficult to to enforce because of things like encryption. You don't necessarily know who it is. So we're gonna here talk about the application of the laws. Okay, um, now for Mark Band 3, you have to make sure that you give a balanced argument. So we can't just argue our own opinions, but we have to make sure we're doing for and against. So we wanna talk about the positives and negatives of each. And it's an opinion-based question, so whatever whatever you prefer, that's absolutely fine. You can talk about what you want. So we can speak about the laws, and then what we need to do is we need to talk about um, real, well, theoretical examples. So you could talk about things like um, music downloading, 
legal and illegal. Okay. Um, you could talk about data and social media. These are all things which have been in the paper. So you can get, you need to give examples and that's generally mentioned in the spec evidence slash example in the uh, mark scheme evidence slash examples will be explicitly relevant to the explanation. And this again goes with all long questions. You have to give examples. Once you've spoken about all of the dif different types of application, the key thing is to do an evaluation where you're going to write a conclusion. In this, it's going to be, you're going to basically state your opinion, but you're going to say why that is in relation to the arguments above. So it's fine for you to have an opinion, that's what they want you to have, but you need to really state it in context of what you've argued before. And remember, your, your argument needs to be balanced. It needs to be for and against. Question seven. A taxi firm is investigating replacing its drivers with self-driving cars. Explain why the self-driving system will use a real-time operating system. Okay, so if we remember a real-time operating system is an operating system that responds with it with a guaranteed uh, has a guaranteed response time. So guaranteed response time, sorry. Okay. Then what we're going to need to do is we need to really apply that to the situation. So we need to state that a we need to state that a car is going to need a guaranteed response time. Okay. Then we need to give some context. We need to state why a car is going to need a guaranteed response time. By guaranteed, we actually mean instant. So what we could say, we could just sort of come and say instant. Um, we need to say why. This is because it will need to stop if someone walks out in front of it. Okay. Part B. The code for the self-driving system has been written using object-oriented programming language. It recognizes obstacles on the road and classifies them. The class for obstacles is shown below. Then you've got the code below, which is for the obstacles. Write a line of code to create an object called bollard of the type obstacle, which is not moving and is 7.8 meters away in the, in the direction of eight degrees. So basically we need to create an object and it needs to be called bollard. It needs to be an obstacle which is not moving 7.8 meters away and it needs to be eight degrees. So we've got a lot of information there. So let's look at how we do this. So if we look in the class, so we've got the class obstacle, so that's going to be quite straightforward. And when we make them, here's the section for making a new one. We have to put in these parameters. So that's given moving, given distance, and given direction. Good. So what we'll do first of all, we're going to say, um, we're going to say it's going to be called, we need to call it bollard. So we'll say bollard equals, and then we're going to use the obstacle class. Okay. And now we need to put in our parameters. So the first is given moving. So it's not moving. So let's think about what data types there would possibly be for moving. So it's either moving or it's not. Yes or no. True or false. It's going to be a Boolean. It's not moving. So we'll set that to false. Next, we need to enter the given distance. The distance is 7.8 meters. And then it's next is going to be the direction. Yep. And the direction is eight degrees. So I'm just going to write in eight there. 
So that's that answer. Part two, describe an example of encapsulation in the class definition code above. So encapsulation is basically when you're using the privates in your, um, in your variables. So it's gonna refer to either moving, distance and direction and encapsulation is just basically saying that you can't change the um, you can't change the variables directly they have to be updated using a method so we've got the method created for creating a new one and we've got a method for updating distance that's going to be it basically that section there so our example is going to be the distance variable so we'll talk about the fact that the distance variable is private And then we can say it can only be changed using the update distance method. Okay. Describe the advantages of using encapsulation. So we've just spoken about what encapsulation is. So the big thing is that it stops data accidentally being changed. And this makes sure that there are fewer errors in the code. Part C, the self-driving car program recognizes people as a special type of obstacle and the class person should inherit the methods and attributes of obstacle. People are treated like other obstacles except when the update distance method is called, if the person is more than two meters away but is five meters or less away, the method controls.beephorn is called. When the person is two meters away or closer, the method controls that apply breaks is called, as well as controls dot beat pawn. So they want us to complete this class. So the first thing we can we can do is it's specified that they there's an inheritance of obstacle. So what we need to say is we need to say that class person inherits ob obstacle. That's quite straightforward. Okay, so we stated that it's gonna inherit all of those features. Next, what we need to do is we need to do the public procedure update, give um, update distance. So we need to write out that code. So let's have another look up here. So when the update distance method is called, if, so we've got a bit of a hint there, if the person is more than two meters away, but is, sorry, more than two meters away, but is five meters or less away, the method controls horn dot beep is called. So what we need to do is we need to say if, and we need to get the distance. So the distance is actually here, given distance, it's been put in as a parameter. So we're gonna say if given distance, and there shouldn't be a space in that. And we're gonna say, less than or equal to five, what happens then? Controls.beephorn is called, called. So we're gonna say controls.beephorn. Okay, now it's actually says in here, if it's more than two meters. So what I'd be tempted to do normally, I'd be tempted to say, and greater than two. However, if we look a bit further down, the next section says that when the person is two meters away. So what we can actually do is we can actually just do another if. So we can say if given distance is less than or equal to two. And we can take it out of here because it will basically go from this if down to this one. So when a person's two meters away or closer, the method controls the applied 
breaks is called as well as controls the beat pawn so actually what will happen is we'll go through this one and we'll call beat pawn which is a part of when they're two meters away and then we'll go to this one here and then we will do controls that apply break okay, and that looks like all of it to me um, is there anything that we're missing nope that looks fine right moving on give one advantage and one disadvantage to the customers of the taxi using self-driving cars rather than drivers so I would always hope that with a self-driving car it's gonna get the route right even when you use, people use a sat nav they sometimes make mistakes so we could say more reliable less likely to make mistakes with the route okay a disadvantage so if we think about it um, how's it going to be controlled presumably there's going to be some aspect of voice control um, I don't know if you experienced this with Siri or Google Assist but when it doesn't understand you okay so does not or may not understand people's voices accents okay so that's talking about the language question eight a student writes a program to apply symmetric encryption algorithms to work on messages of up to 25 ascii characters describe what is meant by the term ascii right so ascii is a character set which uses seven bit um, binary, num binary digits to represent characters. You could even say keyboard characters. Okay. The encryption algorithm works in the following way messages of up to 25 characters spaces and punctuation are not included is placed in a 555 five, five array any lower spaces any leftover spaces will be filled with random letters the message i love computer science becomes and here's what it becomes you've got the i you've got love compu and then it's tusk etc and then the last line is just random the key is a sequence of 10 numbers. In this example, we'll use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The first five numbers state how many spaces the rows 0 to 4 must be rotated. A key with the first digits, the first five digits, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 would result in, and if we have a look here, basically it's pattern, de de pattern recognition. So we're looking at the rows. So if we see here the I, is in the second place but before it was in the first place so we can see it's moved across by one actually which ties in with the number that we have here based on that logic the next number is two so we'd expect the second column the first digit to have moved over by two so if we go over two one two we've got a c there so we'd ex expect c to be the first one here excellent okay going to the next one we've got three so based on that logic if we go one two three We've got a T there and it began with T. So you can see that out of the first five, so we're just dealing with the first five here, okay? Each number indicates how many times the row needs to shift. The next five digits state how many spaces down the columns zero to four should be rotated. Applying the last five digits, one, two, three, four, five to the grid would give, and then we've got the exact same thing um, except we've got it this time it's happening on the columns going down so if we've gone down by one last we've got an E there so the first one should be E which is exactly what we've got here I'll highlight that for you on the second one we've gone down by two one two so we've got an I and I it should have been the first one I yep it's working exactly the same way except the columns are going down 
Part of the pseudocode for the algorithm is written below, and then you've got the algorithm written there. Show the results of running the algorithm on the grid and key below. So we've got a key of 33333111111. So we know that the first half refers to the way that the rows move. Okay, so what we know from that is that actually they're all going to move exactly the same. Okay, they're all going to move by three to the right. So what we can do is we can have a look and it's going to go one, two, three. So the first row is going to move to the fourth position. So what we can do, let's right fill in that first row. Sorry, mine isn't going to fit in the box exactly. So it's the first row in the fourth position now is going to be T, C, E, E, U. The next one is going to be the O column. So it's going to be O, R, S, Y, O. Then we go to the beginning. The next row is going to be the first one. So it's going to be P, E, S, R, G. Next one along is going to be S, T, A, P, G. And the last one is going to be the E column, which is E, M, G, L, Q. Okay, now it's asking us um, to give the grid after the columns have also, the columns have also been shifted. So it's asking us to do the exact same thing, but instead of being the rows, it's going to be the columns and it's going to be based on this, the one, 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 one. So we know that they're all going to shift by one. Okay, so what we can do is we can take them and shift them by one. Now we know the bottom column is going to shift down and it's ultimately going to become the top one. So let's start from there. So the first top is going to be G, G, Q, U, O. Then the top one is going to be the second. So it's going to be P, S, E, T, O. We're going to move on to E, T, M, C, R. The next one is going to be S, A, G, E, S. And then the final one is going to be the R, P, L, E, Y. And there we go. So we've done those shifts just there. Part C, write the procedure shift row. So whenever we write a procedure, we need to define them. So we're going to do def shift row. Now, we don't know what arguments we need. So let's just have a look at the code originally and we'll see, does shift row feature in there at all? Yes, it does, it's just here. Okay, so we've got two arguments in there. We've got i and x, let's figure out what i and x are. So we've got a for loop here with i, which is zero to four. I'm gonna presume that's referring to the current row. And then we've got x, which is get next digit in key. So we can just call that key because that's going to be the current key. So if we go back down. So in here, we are going to have our arguments, which are current row. And we're going to have key. Good. So we've defined it. Now, I think because we're swapping data around whenever you do that you need some kind of generally you need a temporary buffer place so what we can do is we can create another array and let's just call that temp and it needs to be the size five remember with arrays i'm going to do let me just check normally with arrays it's written with um those kind of brackets i'm just going to check what we've got up here does it specify um it doesn't seem to be specified at all. That's used for referencing in there. Um, so we'll just go with these brackets for the moment because arrays are a set size. Right, so now what we need to do is we need to loop through my array and we need to just basically put all of the data from the original one in there. So we know it's gonna be only five and we're working row by row. So we can say four and let's call this 
we'll just call this position in and we're going zero to four so we'll do range of zero to four we're going to say in our temporary we're going to go through the different positions and we're going to set each one to be the data from the original so the original data if we scroll back up can we see where that's called where's the original data entered up up here it talks about it's called grid okay and it's got two parameters five and five so it's going to be grid okay so the first one is going to um, refer to the row that we're on so what we would do there is we would potentially just go with um, what could we call that we could call that well it's not the it's let's just call it um, current row let's use the current row data actually okay and then the next part is going to talk about that piece of data that we're talking about, that we're using so that will be position so we're saying on the current row, um, that position, the current position is going to be copied across. So it's quite straightforward. We're just duplicating, we're just duplicating one array so that we've got a buffer now. So now what we need to do is we need to update our positions. So what we need to do is we're going to do for, and let's create a variable. It's going to be the, let's call it current position. In and it's going to be a range of zero to four okay so we're going to just say what the new positions are for them so we're going to say new equals and the way we do it is we just take the current position or actually yep we're going to say what do we well, let's say current position yep which is zero one two three four and we're going to just add the key onto that so we know what the new positions are for everything so what we have to do now is in our original table we need to set the new the new positions to have the correct data in it so what we're going to say is grid and we're going to say current row and then we're going to say new for the actual um, I guess the column in there and we're going to set that to equals from temp it will be um temp's only got one row in it at a time so it'll just be the current position that one's a bit complicated i'll give you some time to look over that maybe you'll want to pause it part d Modern encryption is much stronger than the method described in the first part of this question. Describe the impact of modern encryption on society. You should refer to the importance of asymmetric encryption and how it differs from symmetric encryption. Different circumstances, different circumstances in which symmetric and asymmetric encryption may be used. Okay, so we need to talk about symmetric, asymmetric encryption and their impact their impact on society and give some circumstances. So let's start off by defining them. So we'll start with symmetric because that's quite simple. Okay, so symmetric encryption only uses one key. Um, the key is agreed and exchanged and it's used to encrypt and decrypt the data. So. Okay, and when you're talking about that, you could also mention the fact that obviously it's only agreed and exchanged when data is being sent. If it's something where it's just one person encrypting data, it's not being shared with another party, then it's not going to be agreed or exchanged. It's just going to be that one key which is used to encrypt and decrypt. Next of all, we'll move on to asymmetric. 
Okay, so asymmetric is a bit more complicated. First of all, there's two keys, okay? It's a private key and a public key. The private key is not shared, but it's just held by, um, it's just held. And the public key is shared. Okay, good. So what happens is that if I want to send data to somebody, what I'll do is I will use their public key. So me, the sender, I use their public key and I encrypt the data so no one else can access it. But the, the problem is, the thing you might be thinking is, well, why doesn't someone else just get the public key and then decrypt it? Well, the data can only be decrypted using the recipient's private key. So, so the sender will encrypt data with the recipient public key and then it will, it can only be decrypted with the recipient private key. And remember, the private key is not shared at all. Only the, only the um, recipient will have their private key. Okay, so we've defined them. Now let's talk about some of the usages. The, the main use of encryption, particularly asymmetric, would be sending personal details, such as credit card numbers. Okay, because particularly because you need them to be secure. Um, an example of the use of symmetric would be, um, like I said earlier, it's when you're not, when there's, when there's no other party involved. For example, if you're backing up data, you don't want someone to get into it so you encrypt it. You don't need to share that key with anyone because it's gonna be you decrypting it. So actually no one else needs that key, no one else needs access to it, it's just you. Other examples would be HTTPS. Um, you could also talk about, I don't know if you noticed, on WhatsApp, I think as default messages are encrypted. So you wouldn't specify WhatsApp specifically, but you talk about instant messaging. Um, and we could also talk about e-commerce. So when you are using Amazon, I'm hoping that they are, I'm pretty sure that they are encrypting all of my data. So like we said earlier, credit card details, we don't want them being shared. So there's some uses in society and they're quite, pretty embedded. Um, a lot of websites are set to HTTPS. I believe Google uses HTTPS. Um, so the data is encrypted for regular searches. Um, we don't even notice that. Instant messaging, again, is, in, is encrypted. E-commerce, you need it to be encrypted. You don't necessarily need all HTTPS to be encrypted. A lot of things which are encrypted you wouldn't necessarily need them to be, but they are because it's embedded in our society. The same for instant messaging. So we want to now move on. We want to kind of evaluate that. And that, this is where some of your opinions come in. Come in. Sorry. Okay. So what we could talk about is, so if we use the instant messaging example, um, why is it that WhatsApp in encrypts its messages is so that authorities can't really spy on people. Okay. Um, I know that the term spy suggests it's a negative thing. You could um, use the term monitor. Um, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that. So the advantages, you, people have privacy. Okay, always a big thing. A disadvantage is that actually people who are breaking the law can do so without being noticed. Another example we discussed earlier is e-commerce. 
okay we wouldn't be able to have e-commerce if we didn't have encryption and also we spoke about backing up files okay so there's some of the uses and you can explain those you can discuss those um, and say why they are necessary question nine demonstrate how the bytes below are added together show you're working so we need to add these two sets of numbers together which is, which is quite straightforward we need to show our working out as well it's going to be easier for me to do this on an excel worksheet just because i can't write on here so easily but you would do it straight onto the exam paper so zero plus one is going to be a one one plus one is two now the way we write two in binary is one zero so what we do is we put the zero here we carry the one over one plus zero plus one gives us two which is zero carry the one one plus one plus one gives us three three in binary is written one one so we're going to do one and carry the other one over one plus zero plus one gives us two which is zero carry the one one plus one plus one gives us three which is one carry the one one plus one plus zero gives us two which is zero carry the one one plus zero plus zero gives us one so our final answer is one zero one zero one zero zero one okay let's go to the next question part b demonstrate how the bottom byte below is subtracted from the top byte show you're working so we need to subtract this number the bottom one from the top one so we'll go back to my worksheet and it's slightly different when it comes to subtraction but we'll see one take away so we've got one take away one which gives you zero one take away zero gives you one one take away zero gives you one one take away one will give you zero now we've got zero take away one we can't go into negative numbers so what we're going to do is we are going to borrow a bit so we can't borrow one from here because that's already zero so we can take one from here so what we're going to do is we're going to just take one away so we'd put a line through i can't do that on here so i'm going to just black it out put a line through that we'll take that down to zero and then we carry it over which makes this one we're going to put a line through this zero here and we're going to change that to a two okay so we've taken one over now let's have a look so we've still got zero takeaway one so we still need to borrow one so we're going to borrow this one um, so we can black that one out because we're taking one away that's going to now become a one and we can make this one a two and that works so we can do two takeaway one gives you one on here we've got one takeaway one which gives you zero zero takeaway zero gives you zero and then we've got one takeaway zero which gives you one so our final answer is one zero zero one zero one one zero good let's go back to the question sheet convert the binary number below to hexadecimal so we've got to take this this whole binary number and convert it to hexadecimal now if we remember hexadecimal it works in four bits it works with nibbles so what we're going to do is starting from the least significant bit we're going to split the number into nibbles so i'm going to highlight them so we've got my first four bits here oops that's not going on I've got my first four bits here and then i've got another four here i'm going to just leave them blank then i'll do my next four and then i've got my final four here and all we now need to do is to convert these numbers into um, binary so it's going to be quite straightforward quite easy for us to do um, we just need sorry not into binary into hexadecimal so we're going to just find the hexadecimal equivalents so starting with the first one we've got um, one one which is three three in hexadecimal is three next we've got zero one 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 which is seven seven in hexadecimal is seven Next, we've got 0000, zero, zero, zero which is just going to be 0. And the last one, we've got 1111, one, 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 which is 15. 15 hex in hexadecimal is an F. So we've got 370F as our answer. Part D. The number below is represented in floating point format with a 5 bit mantissa in 2's complement, followed 
by a 3-bit exponent in 2's complement. Calculate the denary value of the number, showing you're working out. So again, I'm going to go on to an Excel worksheet to do this one. You would do it straight on the page. So I've got my numbers written out there. So I've got my 5-bit mantissa and I've got my 3-bit exponent. So this is all about just representing um, the, um, sorry, numbers with decimals. So the number I've got here is the number 2. Okay, remember that in this the um, most significant bit is um, it's inverted. So you've got the weighting of 1, 2 and minus 4. Okay, so a lot of the time people think that this would just be 4, but you've got to remember that the uh, most significant bit on this would be inverted. Same on here. So we've got an exponent of 2, so that means the decimal point is going to be over by 2. Now, the decimal point always begins here. So what we're going to do is we're going to move our decimal point over two places, so it's going to go 1, 2. So it's going to end up here. Okay, so this is my number. Now we can add our weightings in. So the first one um, before the decimal point is one, and then we just double like normal. So that'll be worth a two. This one will be worth a minus four. And then on this side, we are gonna half. So we, we go to 0 0.5, 0 0.2, sorry, the minus five, that should be 0 0.5 and 0 0.25, okay? So let's see what, what figures we have to add up. So we've got a 2 and we've got a 0.25, which gives us 2.25 as our answer. So the answer to that question is 2.25. Party, the numbers below are represented in floating point with a 5-bit mantissa in 2's complement, followed by a 4-bit exponent in 2's complement. Normalize the numbers shown below, showing you're working out. Okay, so we just need to normalize these numbers. Now, a normalized number, if it's positive, it begins with 0, 1. If it's negative, it begins with 1, 0. If we look at these two numbers, the first one begins 0, 0, so it's not normalized. This one begins 1, 1, so we know that that's not normalized. So we have to normalize them and get them basically so that they are, um, they fit within the 5-bit mantissa and 4-bit exponent, and they need to begin with 0, 1 or 1, 0. We need to show our working out, and to do that, I'm going to do it on the Excel sheet again. You're going to do yours on the actual um, on the actual worksheet itself. So we've got our numbers here. Let's figure out where the decimal point goes. So on this one again, we've got an exponent of two. So based on last time, our decimal point would be begin here, and we're going to move it along two. So it's going to go one two so our decimal point is now going to be here okay we can get rid of this column okay so this is our number now like i said it has to begin zero one so we don't want these unnecessary zeros here so we can get rid of those so our number now we don't need to have actually we can keep that there for now so this is our number. We need to make it five bits again. So what we can do is we can add the extra zeros on at the end. I'm just going to drag this over. Okay, so we need to have five bits. That'll be zero, zero, like so. And this is our, this is now our new number. So if I get rid of this cell here. Okay, so and the decimal point would be here, so we can just set our exponent to zero because we don't because the decimal point's here, which is where it begins, we don't need to shift it at all. So our mantis is zero, one, one, zero, zero, and our exponent is zero, 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 zero. Now we're gonna do the same thing on this task here. I've just got a gap from the question that I did a minute ago, so I'm just gonna fill that. Okay, so we need to normalize this number. Now we can see that this number, because it begins with a one and it's in two's complement, and we were talking about how with two's complement, the most significant bit is, an, is a negative inversion of itself. Um, we know that this is a negative number, so it has to begin one, zero, okay? So let's first of all, let's figure out what our um, exponent is. Our exponent is two plus four, which is gonna give us six. <clears throat> so if we put our, um, decimal point in first, it's going to start here, and we need to move it over 6. So it's gone from here to 1, 2, 3, 4, 
by 6. So it's going to just be after that. So what we need to do is we need to add some zeros in. We've added two more zeros in. Let's just drag that over so it's not getting confusing. So we've added our two extra zeros in. Our decimal point will be here. Okay. So the next thing we need to do, let's get rid of this original decimal point. The next thing that we need to do is we need to make sure it begins one zero. Now all of the reoccurring ones beforehand, the same as reoccurring zeros can just be removed. So if we get rid of these, those two, now we've got our number, if we've got our five digits, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, we've got our five digits. Now remember that the decimal point always begins here. So we'd need to move it over one, two, three, four times. So we need to set our exponent to four, which is going to be this number. So our final answer is a mantissa of one, zero, 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 zero. Don't need the decimal point now. And we're going to have an exponent of zero, one, zero, zero. That's how you do that question. And obviously you'd, you'd have it written on here. Part F. Show the byte below after having an AND applied with the masking byte. So all that we're going to need to do is get our bits and we're going to just AND them with what's in the AND column. So if we start from this side here, 1 AND 1 is going to give a 1. Good. 1 AND 0 is going to give a 0. 1 AND 1 is going to give a 1. 1 AND 1 is going to give a 1. 1 AND 1 is going to give a 1. 1 AND 0 is going to give a 0. 1 AND 0 is going to give a 0. 1 and 1 is going to give a 1. Straightforward enough. And now this question here, we're going to do the exact same thing, but it's going to be an OR. So what you can actually notice, because with an OR, you just need one of them to be positive. All of these are positive, so we know that all of them are going to just be 1s. As long as there's A1, it's going to be positive. And last one. There we go. Question 10. Draw a logic gate diagram to represent the Boolean expression. The Boolean expression we have is Q equals not A or B. So let's start by putting our inputs on and our outputs. So we're going to have an input of A, we're going to have an input of B, and we're going to have an output of Q. So we start off with not A. So to do that, we're going to draw our not with is the triangle with a circle coming off it so we've got not a and then that gets all together with b so let's draw our all and that's going to form an input there and then b is going to become an input and then that's going to get outputted to q okay so it's a bit wobbly but you've got it there so you've got not a or b Part B, find the Boolean expression represented in the Karna map below. Now the Karna map has the tables um, filled already, which makes it a lot simpler. And in Karna maps, what you have to do is you have to find the groups and the groups are gonna be in the Boolean numbers of, the, of groups of one, two, four, eight, 16, and so on. So let's find our first one. We've got one along here. And what we wanna do is we wanna find what is consistent with all of the ones. Now we can actually see that both C and D are consistently off. So if we group them, we're going to group them together with brackets. So we can say the first bracket is going to be, we've got C is off. So that's going to be not C and we're going to say it's going to be not D. Good. Okay, now we need to do the next section. So let's find another group of four. There's one here. We need to find the consistence again. So we can see that actually for all of these, C is off. So we've got C off there. And for all of them, A is on. So we can do our next section. Now we, we link our sections together with alls. So we're going to say or and we're saying not C
and A because A is on. Now we need to find our final section, which is just here, going down. We've got a group of four again. And we need to find what is the constant in all of these. So we need to find what is the same for every single one. So if we take a look at them, we can see that we've got A is always on and B is always off. Those don't change for all of them. So it's going to be A or not B. Sorry, A and not B. So we're going to group them together with another or. And hopefully I can fit this on. We're going to say it has to be A and not B. And there we go, that's how you get the um, Boolean expression from a Carnot map.